Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome. <clears throat> We're excited to bring you all here today. Uh, we see everyone is uh, more people are coming in. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we want to be sure that we keep the time today and we have a lot of great speakers um, who are ready to share a lot of great information with us. Uh, we're really excited about this uh, event to bring together players across the food system about one of my personal favorite topics, beans. Uh, hello, my name is Benjamin and I work with Harvest Plus. On behalf of the U.S. Dry Bean Council and Harvest Plus, a warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us here today. We truly believe that beans are an undervalued and often ignored food group that's a hidden gem in our food system. They're affordable, high value food that can grow in many climates of our world. And beans offer a healthy, tasty food uh, for those in critical need of food assistance and also high income consumers looking for functional health products. Today, as, as you might have seen from the agenda, we've gathered and convened global experts from across the, the world and across the industry to share with you the, the facts and opportunities around beans and together and explain together how we can spread the word about the benefits of beans and ensure everyone has the opportunity to enjoy this delicious, nutritious food crop. Beans are growing in interest uh, around the world and can play a critical role in improving the food system, either in the United States or Rwanda. And we're going to hear from these experts today on a number of ways that beans can play a role in our food system. So thank you again for being with us here. And up first, we're, we're excited to hear from Rebecca Bratner, the Executive Director of the U.S. Dry Bean Council, for some opening remarks. Rebecca, over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Rebecca Bratter, and I am the Executive Director of the U.S. Dry Bean Council. It is absolutely a pleasure to be on this panel this morning and to be with all of you, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll just say a few words about um, the U.S. Dry Bean Council and this brand new partnership that we have with Harvest Plus. Um, I'm excited to be able to kick off the panel and also um, to be able to kick off this, this partnership. Um, you know, we at the Dry Bean Council, we do have a long history of working in the area of food assistance and humanitarian assistance, but this is really a critical moment for us to expand our work. Um, and that includes collaborating with critical and important research entities like Harvest Plus that are looking to find ways to incorporate solutions to global hidden hunger in the everyday foods that we eat and consume. You know, the idea of fortifying our foods through, through breeding techniques is really such a simple solution to one of the principal global threats to human economic development. Um, and that is, of course, malnutrition or hidden hunger. We really have so much respect for the critical work of Harvest Plus, and it's an, an honor to be able to work together so that we can save and improve lives through food. Um, I appreciated the the kind words about beans right at the beginning, um, and I'll just say that on behalf of the Dry Bean Council, um, representing the U.S. dry bean industry, we've always been very proud of this amazing product that we process, uh, grow, and ship right here in the U.S. our dry edible beans. And if you think about it, in so many ways, uh, dry beans are really just the perfect little nutrient delivery device. Um, just in the natural way, in its, in its natural form, out of the soil, um, out of the earth, it provides critical nutrients. But now we're very interested to work together with Harvest Plus to explore the ways and we can make this perfect nutrition delivery device a perfect biofortified nutrition delivery device. We know that this is just the start of this idea um, this is the start of our partnership, and there will be a lot of work and research ahead of us. But we feel that the time is right to do this. There's always critical work going on in our industry um, to improve our bean breeding um, and to improve our seed research with our land grant universities. But this partnership is something new. And if we think about it in many ways, um, while there have been improvements, Beans have not changed a whole lot over the years, but the world around us has certainly changed. 
and that impacts what we do. The demand drivers and the needs of today really reflect a new world reality. And of course, um, as part of that, I would be remiss if I did not mention COVID and its impact. And of course, that's been a major factor. I don't think any of us could have anticipated a global pandemic and the way that it would disrupt our daily lives. And of course, change the way that we look at food. For a while now, beans have been moving, in a sense, from a side dish to the center of our plate. People have been embracing the plant-based lifestyle, looking for plant proteins. Um, and there's a, a strong consciousness about the environment, about the climate and sustainability. And this has certainly translated into the choices people make with their food. But on top of that, COVID has really moved beans into the spotlight as a nutritious, economical, shelf-stable, sustainable, and of course, I might add delicious food. So now we have a new call. In addition to continuing our work of selling beans to buyers around the world, how might we now work together with Harvest Plus and other partners to ensure that beans are the solution now? to add nutrition and value to foods that vulnerable populations consume in areas of the world where hidden hunger, such as iron deficiency, have a devastating impact on the quality of life and the future. So um, with that, I'm gonna conclude my brief remarks. Um, I am again, very excited to, to be able to celebrate this partnership with Harvest Plus. I'm very happy to be on this panel, and I look forward to hearing all of the wonderful remarks that the other panelists are going to make today about beans. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for those inspiring remarks. Um, up next is Arun Baral, CEO of Harvest Plus. Arun. Hi, good morning, uh, and uh, great to be here. And I uh, just follow from what Rebecca is saying. You know, we're really excited about the opportunity to work together uh, to create a more nutritious food system, not only you know here, but for uh, millions of, you know, two billion people are undernourished or malnourished. So this is a really sort of a uh, real exciting opportunity for us to partner with the uh, US Dry Bean Council, the farmers, the bean farmers in the United States and work together to really mm -hmm. make a difference in people's lives. So, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about biofortification, demystify it, it a little. Um, you, you know, Harvest Plus came up with the idea that uh, can, can plants be bred with high densities of, uh, you know, critical micronutrients like iron, zinc, and vitamin A. And then, you know, if these can be consumed by people who are deficient, in, in uh, micronutrients, can your health improve? And in you know, over a 15-year period, uh, we were able to successfully demonstrate that, you know, yes, it works. Um, crops can be bred with the higher densities of micronutrients, and when they are consumed by people, their lives, you know, their health, and their, ultimately their lives improve. So that's the mission of Harvest Plus, is to you know, address hidden hunger or micronutrient deficiencies, primarily in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So that's that's what we have been working on. We have been very successful in getting uh, the crops to our farmers in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and we we think this partnership with a U.S. Dry Bean Council and you know the farmers of the bean growing farmers can really um, not only you know add shine to the beans. You know, Rebecca said beans have been you know um, sort of constant. But here's an opportunity to get a very healthy product. And you know, it's also I see a commercial opportunity for farmers, being farmers in the United States. So, you know, we look forward to this partnership. We look forward to the web webinar. Um, we have um, a great panel. Um, they're gonna talk about, you know, uh, the benefits of beans, obviously, and how, um, you know, these crops can, can really uh, change lives and also create economic opportunities for for you know many people around the world. Their health as their health improve, uh, you know their well being improves. They can do more, and then also for the U.S. farmers here, being farmers, I think this is a great opportunity to at least take a serious look at this crop, and and you know if we can uh, partner together 
um, you know, join our hands. Um, we have also a wonderful opportunity to help improve lives um, across the globe. Remember, 2 billion people um, are suffering from malnutrition and 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet in this world. You know, assuming we're 7.5 billion people, you know, it's, it's a major, um, you know, issue from, a, from, a, uh, from our standpoint. So we look forward to your support. You're, you, you know, we are here to help. We are help, here to provide any uh, guidance and make uh, the U.S. farmers as successful so then they can help improve lives overseas of millions and billions of people. So with that, I turn it back to Ben. Thanks a lot for that great overview, Arun. Uh, I think that gives a clear picture of, of what, why we're all here today, as you said, to join hands together. Um, so up next is uh, Dr. Doug Terran uh, from the University of Arizona. And uh, Doug will be explaining a bit more about uh, the nutrition of beans. Um, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, I'm just going to move right into my presentation. Um, I am giving sort of a, the big overview of the nutritional value of, of beans. Um, so the next slide, um, I do have one disclosure. I'm the Editor-in-Chief for Nutrition Reviews. Uh, it's owned by the International Life Sciences Institute and published by Oxford University Press. However, everything that I present today are my opinions and thoughts about beans and do not represent the opinions of others. So we'll move on. My, my presentation today is going to focus on pulses uh, within the legume family. I, I like this slide because uh, many people do not know how to break down the different categories of legumes. And so um, we can move on. Um, this paper from Nutrition Reviews by Mer Marin Angeli and colleagues uh, recommended that 100 grams of beans be considered a serving, and then shows that this serving would provide a significant amount, about 20% of recommended daily allowance for protein, fiber, folate, and iron, and greater than 10% of the requirements for other minerals. So you can see the nutritional value of beans. Um, in an analysis of the US uh, with the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, 25% uh, of the population uh, consumed beans on one of the two days when a dietary recall was obtained. And in the world, um, as you all know, beans contribute about 15% of total energy intake and 10 to 20% of total protein intake. But in some af areas of Africa and the Americas, beans contribute about 36% of the total protein intake. This indicates that beans are of extreme importance to diet and food security. Now, I'm going to say a few things uh, about what is in beans themselves, and we can move on. Um, as you probably already know, beans are a good source of energy, protein, and fiber, and low in fat. Um, they're known to be low in sulfur amino acids, such as methionine, but this is not an issue. It's, there are readily available foods that are consumed complementary with beans that help provide um, all the amino acids we need in our diet. And uh, they're also a good source of B vitamins, which is often forgotten, and a major uh, source of minerals, including iron, zinc, uh, calcium, and magnesium. Um, we can move on. Um, beans also include a series of what's called bioactive compounds and that go beyond nutrients. The phenolic compounds have antioxidative and anti-inflammatory properties. Although poorly absorbed, saponins have the ability to lower cholesterol concentrations. And the saponins in, for example, chickpeas and other legumes is a calcium activated potassium channel opener uh, and can really support treating cardiovascular, urological, respiratory, and neurological and other disorders. And the oligosaccharides and resistant starches are components of fiber, which affect the gut microbiome. And other microbioactive uh, compounds are associated with decreasing mineral absorption. However, it has been shown that these compounds, like phytic acid, uh, may have beneficial effects and, on health. And various cooking methods and food processing methods, including canning, have been shown to increase the uptake of calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc. Now, the microbiome uh, gets a lot of attention when it comes to beans. And we'll move on, the fiber in beans 
um, is known to increase the diversity of the bacteria in the large intestine. Uh, when these bacteria digest the oligosaccharides, they produce, um, they reduce the pH in the colon, and the bacteria also produce nutrients themselves that are absorbed. Now, increasing the biodiversity of the microorganisms can also influence central nervous system processes bidirectionally via the vagus nerve and through modulation of the immune system. Um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and tryptophan metabolism, along with their ability to synthesize a number of neurotransmitters and produce metabolites such as short chain fatty acids that produce, um, possess neuroactive properties. So these, um, this gut um, brain uh, link is very important. Um, ergothionine is contained in black beans and red beans and has antioxidant oxidant and uh, phytoprotectant properties, but it also has been present in other beans. Uh, it may be present in other beans, but I'm not aware of studies that try to measure its presence. Um, although um, precursors of TMAO, which is trimethylamine and oxide, are found in beans, is believed to TMAO is believed to lead to um, cardiovascular disease. There are substances in beans that can actually reduce the level in blood, and that the production of TMAO is different between diets that are animal-based compared to those that are plant-based. So beans can change um, also the gut's anatomy and not just affect the metabolism. So my next slide has two sets of histology slides that show how navy beans and black beans improve colon barrier integrity, including the crypt height, which is in the top row of slides with NB being navy beans and BB being black beans, and the mucus content and cell proliferation of goblet cells, uh, which is the bottom set of slides. Now, these studies were done in mice, as it's not really nice to get gut histology slides from human research subjects. So you know, these we get from, from animals. Now, uh, we'll go on to the next slide. And I just want to mention something about the gut-brain axis when it comes to satiety or the lack of feeling hunger after a meal. Um, in, in separate studies and systematic reviews, it's been shown that beans can increase acute satiety uh, compared with other carbohydrate-based diets. And this sense of not being hungry is regulated by gut hormones that beans stimulate, such as CCK and PPY3, 36, along with insulin levels. Um, so again, this gut-brain axis is important. And now we'll talk a little bit more about adiposity and, 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 and fat tissue in, in humans um, that are consuming beans. Um, I think we can go to the next one. What I think is of interest is that animal studies suggest that with mice that were fed beans, they had a decrease in weight gain compared with diets without beans. But this was a result of less fat mass, but with no change in muscle mass. So even though they gained less, they still had the same muscle mass as other mice did. And this could be incredibly important if one thinks about issues like sarcopenia in elderly, who lose muscle mass over time. Uh, it's possible that the high protein content of beans was playing an important role in preserving muscle mass. Um, it was also reported that these animals had lower production of TMAO, as I was talking about before. And other studies have also shown that women who were in a group who consumed more beans had excessive weight gain, excessive weight gain during pregnancy and a lower prevalence of gestational diabetes. Now, in relationship to adiposity, there's a relationship with glycemic control and factors related to diabetes. So in some studies that you may know about, the legume-enriched low glycemic index diet, uh, it was reported that subjects with insulin resistance who consume their legume-based diet um, decreased their inflammation response as measured by C-reactive protein, or CRP, and tumor necrosis factor, TNF, improved serum lipids in men compared with what they would call the healthy American diet. They also had lower levels of leptin, which is related to decreasing hunger, even though maybe fasting glucose was slightly higher. Other studies have suggested that the consumption of beans is related to a decreased risk for type 2 diabetes. And for those with diabetes, a lower hemoglobin A1C concentration which is an indicator of better glucose control and better management of the type 2 diabetes. Now we'll move on. Um, I've already 
alluded to some of the factors of bean consumption for cardiovascular disease. Now, I stated um, that the consumption of beans can lower um, blood lipid levels, uh, cholesterol levels. However, the more important issue is that bean consumption of greater than four servings per week was associated with the reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease by 11% for men and 22% for women. And a study in Costa Rica showed that high bean consumption decreased the risk of second cardiac infarcts by 38%. So these are people that had a heart attack, then the chance of having a second one was significantly decreased in those that had a high bean consumption. And a multinational study suggested that there was an 8% reduction in risk for all-cause mortality, which is anything that would kill us, for every 20 grams of daily legume intake. So as you increase your consumption of legumes by your beans by 20 grams a day, every 20 grams uh, um, increase decreases your risk for mortality. Now, my last nutrition topic that I want to mention is the association between bean consumption and child growth. Now, the study by Agapova with children being given either a bean-based diet or corn soy blend diet, and that's often used for food aid, suggested that children fed a bean-based diet grew just as well as low diet corn soy blend, but when challenged with lactulose, had a greater percent of lactulose excreted. This is a measure of intestinal integrity and potentially uh, those anatomical changes that uh, may lead to the prevention of GI infections, which was congruent to the histology data from mice that I presented earlier. Other studies have shown that children are less overweight and that there are also less chance of being identified as wasting uh, when beans are part of a diverse diet. So overall, the consumption of beans can affect many aspects of, of human uh, nutrition and health as seen in this last slide. And then um, my final slide is that many of the items that are growing on the horizon about beans are going to be presented next. Uh, what gets me excited as a nutritionist is the work being done on biofortification of beans, as you will hear regarding iron, and how food processing is allowing beans to be used to develop new food products. I'm also interested in obtaining a better understanding of how home preparation methods can increase the bioavailability of nutrients from beans. And finally, there are studies that suggest that both professionals and the public do not know the benefits that beans can bring to a person's diet, which should be investigated and increased. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we're all so excited. And uh, I know I just learned a lot from that presentation. So thank you very much. Um, up next is Dr. Eric Boy. Um, and Eric will be talking a bit more about biofortified beans and, and how they play a role. Uh, Eric, over to you. Uh, Eric, I, I don't hear you. Nope, uh, still not hearing you, Eric. Okay. Can you hear me now? Hear you now. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, 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 welcome everyone, and thank you for organizing this uh, uh, meeting about a topic that is very close to my heart, beans. Uh, having been born and raised in Guatemala, you know, I, I was uh, raised on beans and corn. So I guess it's not so bad uh, given that I'm already over 60 and don't have any major complaints. So uh, following up on uh, Dr. Tyron's wonderful presentation about all the benefits and potential health benefits of beans, uh, I will focus this uh, summary, very brief summary, uh, on the iron aspects of uh, biofortified beans and the evidence generated uh, since 2005 to date on the benefits of improving iron intake and status uh, in humans. So only human studies uh, on iron biofortification. Next, please. So first of all, why? What is biofortification? Biofortification is, as Arun was saying, an idea basically of breeding crops to increase their nutritional value. 
So we're talking about minerals, vitamins, in some cases, uh, amino acids. And this is done in different ways. Uh, it can be done through plant breeding, through agronomic means by applying fertilizers, like zinc fertilizers. But it can also be done in some cases when the plants themselves don't uh, um, produce enough of these nutrients by transgenic means. Um, so biofortification is uh, has been proving to be a, a cost-effective strategy uh, to deliver more essential nutrients, particularly iron, zinc, and provitamin A, to malnourished populations who would otherwise have little or no access to the other sources of micronutrients, like a diverse diet or fortified foods or supplements being distributed. Uh, biofortification is also sustainable because the cost uh, involved is upfront in research and development and once the varieties are developed you know they become public goods and uh, uh, the, the only investment is done at country level continuing the pipeline of breeding varieties next and as was hinted before beans are wonderful source of many nutrients and 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 phytochemical but the 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 uh, Ideal is for everybody to have food security, nutrition security, and a diverse diet to achieve that. Uh, but that has you know, economic implications, and while the development doesn't reach the population that we are targeting, uh, biofortification is a core and complementary nutrition intervention that helps improve uh, micronutrient status and human health. And it is complementary to the other interventions that are available. Uh, and the application of biofortification along with the other interventions should be a context specific combination of of the uh, of uh, you know given the country and the and the group we are trying to affect thank you next so why beans well dr taran already gave us all the other nutritional benefits uh, i will focus on iron and basically beans help address the double burden of disease because as was previously stated, uh, beans help improve metabolic health, uh, which means decrease the incidence of diseases like diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, uh, obesity, uh, and iron deficiency as well. Uh, but beans are what the breeders consider a fast track crop because it already has, you know, high enough or uh, high levels of iron which can be increased uh, faster than if you start with a crop that has very little iron. So it takes less time to develop high iron varieties. And the varieties that we uh, have been testing, uh, the, the, le the level of iron that we propose is almost twice the level that common commercial varieties have. So going from, let's say, 50 milligrams per kilo to almost to 95 milligrams per kilo iron. Um, so we focus on uh, alleviating iron deficiency and we focus on the uh, groups that are at most risk of developing iron deficiency and the negative outcomes that come along with that deficiency. Children under five and women of childbearing age, adolescent girls. And that's what I'll show you next. So in order to uh, prove the concept that consuming these biofortified beans are indeed uh, an e effective uh, strategy to improve iron status and health among uh, the vulnerable groups of the population. A series of studies have been implemented in our target countries by top researchers from American, European, and, and uh, other universities that have measured the uh, losses or retention of the iron during traditional ways of cooking, uh, how much of that iron is absorbed, and finally, how uh, people benefit when they consume these beans uh, for a three, six month period of time, as they normally would uh, commonly. Thank you, next. So when uh, these beans are consumed on a regular basis as, as they would common commercial beans, and does, does that produce a measurable impact in, in human uh, health, iron status and health, uh, related health conditions? So first of all, the amount of iron absorbed from biofortified beans, as you can see in the natural phytic acid, first two columns, the amount of iron absorbed from these beans that contain more iron is naturally 
higher than from the regular beans. About 20% more iron is absorbed. So that means that uh, the same uh, uh, factors that inhibit absorption from the regular bean are at work with the biofortified bean. Uh, uh, nonetheless, we still get more iron absorbed, almost uh, 30% uh, of the estimated average requirement for women of childbearing age, when uh, women are consuming not 100 grams, as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Tyron was saying, but what they normally consume would be about 200 grams of, uh, of bean, dry bean. But as you can see here too, if you decrease the amount of phytate, which can be achieved through canning because of the high temperatures associated with canning, you increase the bioavailability and the total amount of iron absorbed. We're looking at low phytate beans that are available and natural mutations uh, as a potential way to even increase the absorption availability of this iron uh, currently. But we will talk about biofortified beans with normal phytate uh, from here on. Uh, next, please. So a study done in Rwanda by a consortium of researchers from Cornell University, Penn State University, uh, Institute of Technology, Switzerland, uh, and the University of Rwanda, and also Dr. Wenger uh, from uh, Oklahoma University, uh, provided biofortified beans or common beans to approximately 200 uh, students from the University of Rwanda, who were mostly iron deficient, but not anemic. Uh, and this was done twice a day in the university canteen. So they ate, both groups ate ad libitum, no limits. If they want second serving, they could have them. For 128 days, twice a day, uh, the controlled beans provided about 56% of the daily iron requirement. The biofortified beans, 73% of the daily requirement. And when the difference between the differences across the two groups were measured, uh, the iron biofortified beans uh, uh, generated uh, higher iron stores, uh, improved hemoglobin levels, and a greater total by iron. So iron status was improved significantly Name among watch. the girls that were uh, that consumed uh, biofortified beans for about four and a half months. Next. But you know, what does having a better iron status mean? I mean, if you talk, tell that to a politician, they'll say, so what? Well, the women whose iron status improved, uh, well, they said they felt better, but when we measured that objectively, uh, they were all, uh, their cognitive performance also improved. And this was measured through a set of uh, sophisticated computer uh, tests for solving problems. Uh, related to memory retrieval, the speed of reaction, uh, and attention. And the women whose iron status was improved because of the biofortified beans uh, showed better cognitive function in these spheres of uh, speed, memory, uh, and attention. And when we, well, when Dr. Wenger measured with those electrodes the brain activity in the areas that are supposed to be uh, not well, highly where iron is highly concentrated in, in the uh, neurotransmitters uh, that, that, that are active there. Uh, those areas were more active among the, the, the individuals who had better iron status. And so we have uh, proof that there is better cognitive performance with the implications on learning, uh, school retention, et cetera, and proof that uh, the mechanism was. Uh, uh, explaining this was bra uh, brain activity in the right places of the brain. Next. So, you know, better potential for students and for mental capacity in some areas, key areas, attention, memory, etc. But also when we measured uh, the efficiency uh, of, of, uh, uh, of these uh, women to carry out light workloads, and light workloads uh, means, you know, uh, social pace of walking, uh, unloading a car, doing normal everyday things. So the stationary bicycle that, that was used with a light load uh, and uh, used for testing work efficiency uh, was mimicking those light activities. And the results showed again that 
the women with better iron status uh, had higher efficiency to uh, high wor higher work efficiency. That means they used less energy to carry out these light activities, which can be uh, interpreted as as uh, as also having a uh, potential benefit on the ind individual productivity. They 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 lose le they use less energy for these activities, so they can do them longer, uh, or they can use it to other activities, that energy that is spare. And not only individual productivity, but when you look at this from this uh, social angle, uh, the economic productivity of a society can be improved if iron deficiency is uh, reduced with a simple intervention as, as, as uh, using biofortified beans regularly. And, and so, the evidence is there. You have improved iron status and through that improved cognitive performance and improved work efficiency. What if that wouldn't matter if farmers do not adopt, accept these varieties and grow them uh, because they are not high yielding as what they are used to uh, grow. So when that was, uh, so are farmers adopting the beans? So next slide. It shows a figure that we tracked until the end of 2019. And as you can see, there has been a progressively increasing uh, level of uptake that 2.3 million households, about 10 million people uh, uh, are involved in growing uh, these beans and using them for their own or selling some, uh, sharing some of the seed. Uh, and this to some might look like a lot, but I think it's it's only the beginning of something that can be scaled up, given that all the evidence, the varieties are are there. Uh, the work is still not done. I, I wish there this were 20 million households or 100 million, but ad adoption is there, so farmers are finding them uh, high yielding, resistant to pests, and you know easy to cook uh, when they when they are when they are used. Next. And another indirect proof of this is that in at least 14 countries, uh, iron biofortified iron varieties have been released. Uh, that's about 65 iron varieties, most of them in, in sub-Saharan Africa and some in Bolivia, uh, Brazil, and Guatemala, and Salvador, as you can see. So scaling up uh, has begun, but it needs to uh, the biofortification of beans and the production of high yielding, high iron varieties uh, is only beginning, and many more countries need to uh, to be exposed to, to these uh, varieties and to be able to use them. As you can see, there is market there for that. Next, and in an ideal world where or country or group of people who uh, where bean bean consumption is uh, at a high level from biofortified beans. What happens is, what is the impact of that? Uh, you know, we saw the biological impacts and the potential economic impact, but if we look at it in terms of the, the, the years lost to productivity because people are sick or children, children are born prematurely, uh, et cetera, uh, we see uh, also a positive picture. Let's see the next one. And so in the case of Rwanda, uh, currently, the population there, uh, the, the market share occupied by biofortified beans is about 20%. So at that level of adoption and, and, and market share, the annual burden associated with iron deficiency health outcomes, like the ones I just mentioned, uh, if at 20% uh, uh, market share, about $16 million would be uh, regained from, from regaining that disability caused by iron deficiency, just from the beans at 20% market. If that were doubled, let's say in Rwanda, if 40% of the beans consumed were biofortified, the amount of uh, economic impact regained from that, from people not spending time uh, uh, experiencing illness or prematurely dying, uh, like maternal deaths associated with, the, uh, with severe anemia, about 23 million will be regained uh, by biofortified beans alone. So the impact is significant uh, for countries where beans are 
one of the main staples. Okay? And so I think that the evidence is all there. The enthusiasm I hear uh, is also there, and there's a lot of work to be done, and we have all the tools in hand, so it's a matter of continuing with the enthusiasm and getting that work done to scale up and mainstream uh, being biofortification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, amazing benefits of beans, uh, biofortified beans, really and truly. Uh, I'll just also note to everyone, uh, you're welcome to follow along in our in our uh, agenda and learn more about our speakers and read more about beans by clicking the handouts tab. It'll be within the toolbar that you have within your meeting. So feel free to go ahead and, and check those documents out. Next up uh, is Thoric uh, Setterstrom. Uh, Thoric's the International Food Aid Representative from the U.S. Dry Bean Council, and we're really excited to have you here, Thoric. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and it's a great privilege to be on this panel and to uh, follow in the footsteps of the two previous speakers who really laid out a a very clear uh, understanding of the nutritional value of both uh, regular beans and biofortified beans. So uh, as a representative of the U.S. Dry Bean Council, I just want to echo Rebecca's comments that we're quite pleased to be part of this uh, strategic uh, partnership with Harvest Plus and advancing uh, the agenda on uh, improved uh, cultivation, production, and consumption of of dried beans. So I want to speak uh, in my allotted time just on the um, make a case for the value of beans in international food assistance. And I'm going to particularly focus on school feeding. Uh, one, because it's a subject matter that I know quite well and I firmly believe in. And it's a it's a good investment of, of limited resources to uh, foster both the nutritional and cognitive development of, of young children to help them grow into productive, productive adults. So uh, next, please. Uh, just put some numbers together uh, just to show some of the dimensions of the, of the problem at a global level. Uh, Depending on where you look, uh, there's slightly different numbers, but these uh, seem to be fairly accurate. There's almost 150 million children that are chronically undernourished, meaning they haven't obtained the linear growth uh, that is optimal for their age. Uh, 50 million are acutely undernourished. They're, they're wasted. They're thin for their age, and that's usually due to some sort of um, a crisis uh, situation where their bodies are literally wasting away. Uh, evidence that uh, undernutrition is a direct or underlying cause of 45% of all child deaths globally. Uh, another rising issue is uh, overweight and obesity as populations uh, flee rural areas and the poverty of rural areas and they move to urban areas and they're uh, farther away from direct food production and rely on market-based systems for their food supply. We're seeing a, a rapid rise in, in uh, overweight children as well as obese children. Uh, we've alluded to COVID-19, but COVID-19 currently seems to have exacerbated these problems. It's uh, disrupted supply chains, uh, the free movement of food. Uh, uh, in systems that are already fragile to begin with. And so that's um, had all sorts of impact on prices and availability of food, also reductions in household income for people to acquire food. Uh, it's also compromised education, right? And kids going to school, right? My daughter's in the next room uh, studying online. Uh, very fortunate to have that option, but in many places of the world, children may not have the option to do that and not only restricts learning, uh, but it also restricts access to school meals, which could be in many cases, the most significant nutrient intake that some venerable children have in different parts of the world. Uh, some estimates uh, think that uh, moderate and severe wasting could increase by approximately 14% because of COVID. And that uh, as a result of the reductions in nutrition health services, we could have 
almost 130 more additional deaths of children under five in 2020. Next slide, please. So international food assistance, you know, it's really a mechanism that was developed many years ago uh, and basically in response to, to uh, malnutrition uh, figures and uh, the 2 billion people that uh, Arun uh, referred to. Uh, and it is basically, these are trailing indicators of failure of the global food system itself. And in certain countries, national food systems are particularly vulnerable. It's a manifestation of that. COVID-19 has just accentuated uh, those underlying pre-existing uh, problems. The appropriate response requires us to do a uh, careful analysis of the immediate and underlying causes uh, in countries with the deepest burdens and develop appropriate programmatic responses. Uh, investments in longer term development, uh, especially economic growth is required. Uh, you want people not to be vulnerable anymore and to do that they need sustainable viable livelihoods to do that and that requires concerted effort by all actors involved. Uh, in the short term, however, you know, properly designed food assistance programs can temporarily fill that gap of required nutrients, both macro and micro, uh, uh, as a way to uh, ensure that these uh, vulnerable populations receive the nutrition that they require. One type of assistance, the one I want to talk about, uh, that has universal benefit, regardless of any context, because we know in the United States and other developed countries that school feeding is just, it's a good thing to do. The, the benefits are multiple and they're well documented and the evidence base is quite clear. And so it applies in the United States as it applies anywhere else in the world. Uh, from the U.S. government perspective, the larger, largest mechanism for uh, supporting uh, school feeding is the USDA McGovern Dole Food for Education. It is the primary uh, actor, uh, not only in the USG portfolio, but in terms of the amount of commodities and money uh, that is uh, marshaled there, it is the largest school feeding program in the world. Next slide, please. So what are some of the benefits? I'll just go through these quickly because uh, they're, they're fairly self-evident, but uh, nonetheless, the, the documented evidence base is quite strong around here. It does alleviate uh, short-term hunger. Kids that come to school hungry with their stomachs empty and growling have a hard time concentrating and paying attention. Uh, we've heard from the previous uh, two speakers about the nutritional value of, of beans, but school feeding, it, can, if it's designed appropriately, address micronutrient deficiencies and uh, even anemia in particular. Uh, if done appropriately, of, of inculcating appropriate uh, dietary practices, what is a good diet, what is a balanced diet. Uh, so that goes with uh, nutritional education. Uh, it can be used to prevent obesity and uh, overweightness. We know it improves in, uh, enrollment and attendance, it improves cognitive and acad academic uh, performance, and it can contribute to better uh, gender equity and access to education. Instead of school kid, girls being kept home to work in the household and domestic chores or, or child care of younger siblings, uh, uh, appropriately designed school uh, Feeding programs can be an incentive to a household to send those uh, children to school that otherwise wouldn't go. Next, please. Uh, so real quick, I just want to make the case <laughs> of why beans, what are some of the features of U.S. dry beans? Why are they uh, a, a good choice if you're a programmer and looking to design a school feeding program, uh, why would you consider beans uh, among any other commodities that are on the, on the USDA uh, commodity list? First, they're just a preferred food uh, throughout the world. You do not have to make a hard case to kids to get them to eat beans, right? So you could choose a whole variety of perhaps nutritious foods, but if kids won't eat them, uh, it's, it's wasted, uh, it's a wasted offer, right, that doesn't get consumed. So kids need to eat it, and beans 
uh, have been shown throughout the world, cultural preference for this particular uh, pulse. Uh, there are nutrition powerhouses. I won't go into that because uh, two previous speakers covered that quite adequately, but I just might emphasize the safety uh, aspect of it, you know, that uh, if you provide children with uh, 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 an adequate portion of beans as part of a school meal program, you do fill them up, right? And uh, you can pack in a lot of nutrition in a very short uh, delivery mechanism that will offset the substitution effect sometimes that we see that poor households, when they send their kids to school for school meal, uh, they'll offset it by downsizing their food at home as a way of cost saving at home. And so anticipating that if you put beans on the menu, you could uh, have a net positive impact on the nutrition rather than just having it uh, uh, cancel itself out. Uh, they're affordable, they're cost competitive per uh, nutritional serving. Uh, they work well for uh, both direct feeding and development programs. And here, you know, you can, uh, I've worked on many school feeding programs where you work with local industry to develop ready to eat products mm -hmm. that can be served right when the kids go to school and you don't have to have a school kitchen, you don't have to worry about school uh, hygiene. Uh, you can work with uh, a local company to develop uh, value-added bean products. Uh, beans are also quite easy to store and handle. Uh, they come in uh, 25 to 50 kg bags with, uh, with uh, appropriate lining in there, and they can be stacked and stored uh, quite well. Uh, also, there's a, a potential of just substitute ordering, meaning if one variety is not available, there are many other choices that you can choose from. And uh, given the, the breadth of production in the United States and the diversity of production, we can almost always match up a U.S. variety of beans with a locally preferred variety of beans as well. So next slide, please. So these are just some of the varieties we have, Pintos, Navy, Great Northern, Red Kidneys, some of the lesser varieties, Atsuki, Garbanzo, Lima Beans, uh, and there's some other niche ones that we have for specialty markets. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just to uh, say how we can help you. You know, if you are an implementing organization, you're thinking of applying for McGovern Dole, please, and you want to consider beans, please contact us. And we'd be glad to help you find the, uh, the right variety of U.S. beans to meet uh, your, your uh, particular cultural context in which you're operating in. Uh, so we can help sync your program needs with the supply. And that means, uh, you know, knowing when to order uh, because the price will fluctuate according to supply here in the United States. So putting an order in at the right time will get you the best price and we'll assure you that uh, the supply is, is, is adequate to meet your needs. Uh, we can also help and advise on uh, local transportation storage, as well as preparation. We have a host of recipes from around the world uh, that uh, work in uh, institutionalized feeding situations, such as school feeding. And also, we're, we're quite interested in partnering with a limited number of implementing mm -hmm. organizations on, um, on uh, designing and working with private sector actors in the target countries for developing value-added products for school feeding. These would be ready-to-eat uh, products. I think our colleague uh, Sharon is going to present on some of the stuff that are, is available commercially, but we would be quite interested in in the local context, what could be developed uh, that would be fit for purpose for school feeding. Next slide, please. And so if you uh, are interested, this is my contact information. It will be available in other sources. There's our website, our sister organization, the Bean Institute has a plethora of information, both nutritional and pragmatic information about beans. And then, of course, our big commercial event every year is BeanCon. BeanCon 21 is launching uh, next week. If you want some information on that, too, we can provide you on that if you're interested in commercial aspects of beans. And that's it. Hopefully, I saved some people some time. Other presenters. Much appreciated, Mark. Uh, I think that was a great overview of the 
of all the great things that the beans are already doing and can continue to do and the food aid system. So thank you. Um, we are running a little bit behind time, but so we're going to try to speed it up a little bit because we want to be sure we're respecting everyone's time here. So I'll turn it over to Katri Angus. Uh, she's the uh, Senior Regional Nutritionist for the World Food Program in uh, West and Central Africa. And she's going to talk a bit more about what WFP is already doing when it comes to beans and food aid assistance. Katri Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'll take off my video. I just wanted to say hello to everyone and it will be easier to hear me if I take off my video. So thank you. Um, obviously, indeed, in uh, Western Africa, as you know, uh, we will see on the next slide, uh, there are a lot of uh, emergencies uh, going on in this region. We are looking at close to 30 million people in food insecurity and 10 million children uh, that are at risk of being acutely malnourished and you see the hotspot areas indicated there. On the next slide you can see how this translates into number of beneficiaries that we reach every year and you can see the very significant increase over the past four years and obviously uh, we are distributing food uh, food is imported, but also more and more food is being locally uh, procured in the region or in the countries where we do the food distributions. And you can see it's about 280,000 metric tons that are purchased in the region, which is a significant increase compared to uh, 2019. Uh, of these 280,000 metric tons, you can see that almost 50,000 metric tons were beans and value accounts for approximately 25 million US. And this is again a very significant increase uh, to 2019. So in addition to uh, procuring food and importing food, we also have more and more cash transfers, which is distribution of cash or a voucher to beneficiaries, which then allows the beneficiary to go to the local market to access uh, the food. So as a conclusion on the next slide, what does this mean uh, for us and the food assistance that is in this region, but it's not only this region, it's a general trend. Clearly needs are increasing while we also reducing dependence on imported commodities. And I think these are two very important conclusions because it leads us to the need to look at the development of local value chains for nutritious foods. Obviously, uh, we're distributing food to reduce food insecurity, to reduce malnutrition. All these different individuals have their own uh, energy and nutrient needs that are taken into consideration when the different food baskets uh, are put together and distributed. Obviously, we need to understand very well the market, how people access food, how they can afford nutritious foods, what is happening on the production side, food processing, obviously distribution mechanism, the even uh, retail markets, and making sure that our beneficiaries consume the right food. So, Looking then on the next slide, uh, where I introduce some of our analysis that we have done. Maybe some of you are familiar with the field and nutrient gap analysis, which is uh, the analysis of um, the affordability of nutritious foods for the different households in the different countries, in the different regions, in those countries, and across the different seasons. In general, on average, what we have seen in the region, at least four countries where this analysis was done, half, no, no, sorry, uh, three out of four households can afford uh, an energy rich diet, which means that this diet will um, cover their energy needs for 75% of the households. However, on average, only half of the households can access a nutritious diet. Obviously, uh, the portion of households that cannot afford a nutritious diet is much higher in uh, the fragile areas uh, during lean season, even up to 
four out of five households that cannot afford a nutritious diet. So you can see from this slide that depending on, on where you are, it's not only a matter of being rich or poor, the purchasing is influenced also by the availability of foods. And this is very important, as you see an example here in Mali, across the different regions, the purchasing patterns for the rich and the poor are similar in the same areas, but they're very different between the different areas because foods are not equally available. When we go to the next slide, we can see that prices also of the different food items vary a lot depending on, again, the different livelihood zones. Very interesting to see that the prices of pulses uh, did not vary a lot in uh, this particular case, but it's very important to understand the fluctuation of the prices and obviously this influences the affordability of the nutritious foods to the different population. In the next slide, we will see that proportionally, obviously in the current diet, there is an over, over focus on the production of staple foods in this region and of, of, obviously people tend to eat much more staple foods than other uh, more nutritious foods and you can see that even in the current diet there is a, a lot of um, uh, expenditures going to staple food but still a very significant portion also going to legumes and pulses when we go to the nutritious diet, the proportion of the staple uh, reduces, but the proportion of the legumes and the pulses remain the same, uh, indicating that uh, legumes and pulses are, uh, when available, are part of even the current, current diet and clearly have a significant role to play also in the nutritious diets. In the next slide, we have a little um, analysis on what the cost of nutritious diets are for the different household members. And we can see that lactating woman, uh, the, the cost of a nutritious diet for a lactating woman is much, much higher than for an adult man. And you can see this is also the case for the adolescent girl. While the young child, the, the nutritious diet is not that costly for the very simple reason that young children eat less uh, than adults. But this is a very important finding and it helps us understanding the different options we have to reduce these costs for these most nutritionally vulnerable groups. As you can see on the next slide, we have done a small simulation where uh, foods are available in the market before they're not necessarily easily affordable. Certain beneficiaries, we can give them a voucher so it makes these nutritious foods available or we can make sure fortified foods are available in the market. Why not promote biofortified beans in the market? Or obviously it can also be complemented with any type of macronutrient supplementation. Just to indicate that when you have a good analysis of what foods are in the market, how affordable or non-affordable you are, you can adjust your interventions to make sure that people can afford these foods. Going to the next slide, I just want to highlight as well that it is not just about adjusting uh, food consumption and food utilization through the different programs, the distribution programs, but WFP has a dual mandate also in the development area, which is a little less known, but it, it's also positioning us along the value chain and the food system from farm, farm to fork. And of particular interest is our work on the smallholder farmers uh, to help them also accessing uh, the market with uh, good quality foods. And obviously we heard from the previous panelist um, information around school feeding. WFP is a big player in the school feeding arena. And we're also looking at uh, local production uh, for school feeding. We have, Elle mentioned already, uh, procurement options uh, that we have, and with that, we are also working with the private sector to ensure 
quality uh, production processing transformation of certain foods, uh, including uh, complementary foods or specialized nutritious foods. And I mentioned also the analytical capacity we have to make sure that we can indeed adjust also policies, maybe to grow less staple foods, but maybe promote more uh, the, the production of more nutritious foods. So let me finish uh, by saying that um, in the next slide, that um, food systems, uh, we see clear trends that we are reducing dependence on the long value chains and Clearly, it has uh, advantages in terms of reducing carbon footprint, which is not, uh, which is an important uh, advantage, but also supporting local economies because it forces us really to look at the local food systems strengthening, looking at how we can, on one hand, continue providing emergency support, but also link that to resilience building uh, combined with uh, food system strengthening from farm to fork. As I mentioned, obviously WFP is doing this not alone and is working with a wide variety of partners uh, to try to make that happen. Um, you are familiar with the WFP's mandate on the SDG2, zero hunger, uh, very much uh, supporting governments and the partners in reducing food insecurity and malnutrition. Let me stop here. Uh, I'm of, of course available in case you have any questions and I thank again the organizers for having me as a panelist in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Katrian, for, for highlighting how uh, important role beans can play in giving someone an affordable diet, uh, whether they're anywhere around the world. Um, uh, as Katrian mentioned, we will have a question and answer session that will come at the end. We have two more speakers, um, but if you do have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the question um, tool that you'll see in the WebEx meeting. Um, uh, so feel free to go ahead and submit those now. Um, and we can go ahead and start to, to pull them together and identify who needs to answer them. Uh, so up next, uh, we're happy to welcome Dr. Sharon uh, Hopper. Uh, Sharon is a research associate at the Department of Plant and Soil and Microbial Sciences at Michigan State University. She works with beans and food product innovation, and we're really happy to have you here, uh, Dr. Sharon, to talk more about uh, the new and exciting ways that beans can be integrated onto the plate. Uh, thank you, Ben, for that introduction. Um, so good day, everybody. Uh, today I'll be discussing some of the research that we have been doing here at Michigan State as it relates to innovating dry beans and leveraging their nutritional benefits for convenient, healthy foods. Next slide, please. As you've heard from the previous speakers, dry beans are a powerhouse of nutrition. They're packed with protein, fiber, minerals, and vitamins. Um, there are several market classes of dry beans as well, and these exhibit a variety of seed, uh, different seed colors and sizes. Um, traditionally, they're consumed as whole seeds after the, 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 the seeds are soaked and boiled or consumed in the canned version. Dry beans, however, often require long cooking times, and this can be a hindrance for con increased consumption. Next slide. One of the ways this to address this hindrance or barrier is to use dry beans as a powder or flour ingredient. And this is taking trend in the marketplace now to really create value added bean based food items. Um, and several food manufacturers are currently using this approach to create new categories of products and repositioning old ones such as pastas and chips from bean flours. Now, taking this direction definitely will provide an alternate market for our bean farmers. Next slide. Several challenges can occur when formulating with whole bean flour, such as flavor and texture concerns. One of the major factors affecting consumers' purchase of plant-based foods is taste. And we all know how important taste is. Now, bean flours can be vegetative, grassy, or even bitter. To overcome this challenge, um, many manufacturers or, or persons or individuals working with bead flour utilize pretreatments. And some of these pretreatments involve heat, such as roasting, extrusion cooking, 
and boiling are often used. And, and others sometimes use fermentation as a method to uh, combat flavor issues. Another fix is to use other types of flowers, whether uh, they be rice flour, oat flour, or even whole wheat flour, to form composites, which are able to dilute the off flavor effects of bean flour, as well as improve texture. We all know that gluten is, um, gives wheat flour its elasticity, is absent from bean flours and all gluten-free flours, and this can lead to textural problems. To compensate for the lack of gluten, starches, gums, and leavening agents are often used, and most manufacturers currently use xanthan gum in their gluten-free applications. Additionally, bean flours also require more water to hydrate than wheat flour because of their high protein and fiber contents. And we have also observed that the type of milling system used for processing dry beans can impact flour and product quality. Next slide, please. One of the most common mills used to produce gluten-free flour is the hammer mill. We have experimented milling beans with a hammer mill and this yields satisfactory results. We have also experimented using a novel milling system, and this milling system was manufactured by a local company, Adagon. This uh, milling system is called a compression decompression milling system, and it allows for the production of dry bean flours with variable particle sizes, and this is very important when you're dealing with products and protein contents based on where the flours are collected or which zones the flours are collected from. We have found that this milling system actually produces bean flours with better end use qualities and have used it to generate most of our bean flours that we have been working with. Next slide, please. We have also made bean pastas using different uh, bean varieties, such as black beans, which is most familiar to people now. You, you see them on the shelves. But we've also included other bean varieties such as yellow beans, navy beans, white and red kidney beans in our formulations. And third, mentioned the school feeding program. So, you know, I believe that pastas would be the ideal or the perfect nutrient delivery system for a school feeding um, program. We already know how nutritious whole beans are, but we wanted to understand the impact processing has on the nutrition of bean flowers such as iron bioavailability and glycemic response. Next slide, please. As mentioned, we know that processing of flex influences the end product. So that boiled beans, whole beans, retain their cell structure as can be seen in the upper light microscopy image. If you look closely, notably you'll see that the cell walls are intact and in contrast with our bean flour, the cell walls break open, releasing their contents. Here we tested the iron bioavailability of both cooked whole beans and pastas made from bean flour. We found that the iron bioavailability of white beans increased significantly in the bean pastas compared to the whole boiled beans. Now this finding can be leveraged to make food products to address the global problem of iron deficiency and anemia. A point to note here, though, is that this increased iron bioavailability may not be the case for all bean color classes, and we have to take that into consideration when we are formulating products as well. Next slide, please. Now, the opposite effect was seen for glycemic response, and glycemic response basically indicates how quickly our bodies break down carbohydrates in a meal to release glucose. A slower sustained glucose re release is beneficial, especially for individuals with diabetes and insulin sensitivity. As seen in the figure, whole beans elicited a lower response than the bean pastas, which were made from flours milled using a hammer mill and the novel compression decompression mill. Take note here, the bean pastas resulted in a slower release of glucose when compared to white bread made from wheat flour. So, Eating products made with uh, bean flours is beneficial for your um, how glucose is released in your body. So there are nutritional benefits to be gained by consuming bean flours. However, consumers do not only eat foods for nutrition, but also 
for taste. Next slide, please. We conducted a sensory consumer sensory evaluation on our single bean variety pastas, meaning that each of these pastas was made with a particular variety, whether it's black bean or navy bean or white kidney beans. And we compare this um, to a wheat standard pasta. The bean pastas contained approximately 90% whole bean flour, meaning that the bean flour contained the seed coat as well. So every year you're getting all of that fiber as well. Um, as well as it contained 10% tapioca starch. Now, participants were asked to rate the attributes of appearance, aroma, flavor, texture, and overall acceptance on a nine-point hedonic scale. And what we see here is that overall, people preferred the wheat pasta. And this is to be expected because this is mainly due to the familiar taste and texture of wheat. However, the bean pastas also received good ratings for all the attributes measured. Some participants even commented that they would purchase the bean pastas when they become available. For this project, we partnered with a local artisan pasta maker, Italiana Homemade Pasta, to innovate and scale up from lab prototypes. Now, Italiana is currently in the process of making bean pastas commercially available to consumers using the myriad of uh, bean varieties that are available on the market. Next slide, please. As you can see, bean flour is extremely versatile and can be used for snack and savory foods. We made chocolate chip cookies using a base composite flour of 70% cranberry bean flour, 29% tapioca flour, and 1% xanthan gum. And we had our in-house tasters um, rate these chocolate chip cookies. And they enjoy the cookies. And you know, a few people thought that they were comparable to oatmeal cup cookies. So this says you could replace your oatmeal cookies in essence with our um, bean flour cookies. There are so many other you know, new gluten-free flours on the market as well that can complement bean flours in terms of nutrition, texture, and flavor. And there are many opportunities to include composite flours, especially biofortified flours made from beans, you know, cassava, sweet potato, and maize in many food applications. And I think we should be starting to utilize these composite flours in our food applications. Next slide, please. Another food application that we utilized um, composite flour in is pizza, which is an American favorite. This time, instead of cranberry bean flour, we used yellow bean flour generated by the compression decompression mill, which produced bean flours with varying protein contents, as mentioned before. So our base composite contained 70% yellow bean flour, containing either 14%, 24%, or 35% protein, along with tapioca and xanthan gum. Again, our in-house testers, um, you know, volunteered to taste our pizza and they prefer the pizza made with a 35% protein yellow bean flour. Um, they commented that the pizza crust was extremely fluffy um, and that pizza made with bean flour containing 14% was the least favorite and was a bit doy. All pizzas were processed under the same conditions so that we could assess how the protein content would influence uh, taste and texture. Next slide, please. Now, innovating dry beans is also happening internationally. Um, a multidisciplinary team, including researchers from Chambogo University in Uganda and Michigan State University, and this was funded by the Gates Foundation, came together to produce a culturally acceptable food that is high in iron and folic acid. And this was with the goal to improve the iron status of pregnant women, as well as improve infant birth outcomes. Now in this study, we developed an instant bean silverfish sauce that can be eaten with their local foods, such as ugali or matoki. The, the, the beans or the, um, the sauce was used, was made using 90% extruded iron by fortified yellow beans. And this is the narrow three beans that were released by Harvest Plus. 
These beans are not only iron rich, but their iron is very bioavailable due to the processing method employed. Where the cell wall is broken and the iron becomes more accessible to be used by the body. Now, the instant bean fish sauce can be easily made by adding hot water and mixing. Our plan is to eventually package the dried fish sauce into sustainable, edible pouches or pods that are dissolvable in hot water. Now, I believe that this technology can be used in the US and other countries to produce instant high protein high fiber bean based products similar to the concept of instant oatmeal here in the US and adding all the necessary spices to have just that convenient food product where you just only need to add water. Next slide please. So to sum it up all dry beans are very nutrient dense you know diversity exists in terms of the seed shapes and sizes and color and it can be used as a whole seed or a powdered ingredient. Um, bean flour can deliver different nutrient profiles based on the different types of pretreatments used. And obviously, the possibilities for innovation are endless. Uh, next slide, please. Now, starting in March 2021, which is just in a few days, um, Ray Sadahara, a graduate student in our lab, We'll be conducting a survey about the food industry's views on usage of pulse flowers. For further information, please contact Ray using the email listed on this slide. She would really love to have your support and hear your views on how using or not using um, bean flowers in your formulations or in your manufacturing process um, could help or not help. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, I'd just like to thank our partners and collaborators who have made all um, the work that we have been doing possible. And Thanks finally, so next slide. Thank you all for listening um, and your time. Thanks, Sharon. We really appreciate you and uh, all that innovative work. Uh, it's amazing. I can't wait to get a box of that bean pasta. Uh, we'll move quickly because uh, I know we're short on time. Up next is Matthew Chipaldi. He's from Euromonitor. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Uh, the most amount of time possible. Thanks, Ben. Uh, yes, it's it's Matt Tripodi from Euromonitor, Monitor, and uh, I've got a presentation here. I'm going to really fly through it. So uh, please, we're gonna it's going to be like a rocket ship. Strap yourself in. I'm going to give you some insights. I'm going to talk uh, at this topic at a different level, looking at consumer trends and key accelerators of demand for beans uh, globally. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is about our company, Euromonitor. What it essentially says is we're really big. We do research all around the world, and you, you may want to listen to us. Okay, next slide. So essentially, the dry bean sales right now really represent a substantial um, uh, number globally. Uh, typically, dry bean sales are they're in the they're in the range right now, uh, if, depending on who you're trusting, of uh, 33 to 38 billion dollars. This effectively means that if you made dry beans a global, just a global business, and you, you gave it a name like Dry Bean Inc., that uh, on the high end, it would actually be bigger than companies like Coca-Cola. So this is uh, an enormous thing. This would be bigger than Fujitsu, it, uh, you know, bigger than many, uh, you know, major multinational companies. Now, growth estimates over the next five to 10 years indicate that uh, it should be growing at a compounded annual growth rate of about 2.2 to 5% per year. There are higher estimates than that, and I tend to favor the higher end of, of this measure. Uh, importantly, and as you kind of heard before, is, is that it's not just about dry beans, it's about, uh, it's about bean fractions, and it's also about bean ingredients. Next slide. So, all of beans and bean fractions and ingredients, they found their way into so many different areas, right? We have, we have bagged, we have canned, it's in confectionery products, noodles, pasta, alternative dairy products, of course, bakery, soups, sauces, dressings, all sorts of, um, you know, tahines and curries and baby food. There are many more applications for it. Um, essentially, what this is, what's nice to recognize about this is that it, there's a lot of innovation going on in this space, and it's driving the development and uptake of beans globally. Next slide. 
So uh, there are really six major things that are, are kind of governing uh, global demand. I just want to mention them. These aren't the only ones, but they most things fall into these six categories. First of all, consumers are looking at food as a protector and a cure. Uh, think of that as protector and cure for common health problems, uh, obesity, uh, high cholesterol, um, blood pressure issues, those sorts of things. Uh, the second thing is, is that there's also uh, this health focus intensifiers that are out there. Um, this is where, uh, you know, disease outbreaks, uh, COVID-19 makes us take an inward look about what foods we're eating and what foods we're stocking in our pantry. Um, also uh, issues of malnutrition uh, clearly in this bucket as well, um, as well as government and international uh, development initiatives that are looking at sort of uh, helping uh, nutritional levels uh, for, for uh, the population around the world that is uh, you know, malnourished uh, meet their needs. Beyond this, there's increasing awareness that food choices uh, have impacts on the environment. And so consumers uh, are looking to see, uh, you know, if I can uh, support uh, the world, you know, how can I do that through my food choices? Um, so um, this is where uh, beans and pulses in general uh, are also kind of gaining ground. Uh, there's another factor driving this too, of course, is population growth. I'm gonna explore that a little bit further. Uh, but also uh, this number five, uh, we have improving global supply chains and efficiencies. So as more groups are getting involved in beans and uh, as we look at things like the digitalization of trade, uh, opening up markets, even with all the trade battles that are taking place, there is an ecosystem here that is evolving toward moving more product around the world. Um, and as we do that, uh, beans are going to uh, benefit from that. Uh, lastly is, is that topic that we again touched on, which is this increasing innovation, promotion, promotion and usage. So we're hearing about beans not only for you know, helping uh, you know, to treat malnourishment, but we're also hearing about it uh, as, uh, you, you know, as a, uh, a plant-based alternative meats, uh, ways to serve both developing and developed markets, uh, snack products, all sorts of things that are placing it not just in the hands of you know, individuals who are malnourished, but for those who are looking for the health benefits uh, that, that it's going to provide and uh, to find ways to eat, uh, I would say, maybe guilt-free uh, some of their favorite foods. Next slide. So we've, we've kind of touched upon this and so just a quick recap, there is health appeal, right? It's natural, a clean label ingredient. It appeals to vegans, low cholesterol, low glycemic index, generally low in fat. They're high in antioxidants. They're, you know, uh, it's sustainable. It's a relatively uh, low water demand compared to many other agricultural products. And it actually supports the soil nitrogen fixing. It can reduce dependence on synthetic fertilizers. Those are just part of the appeals of this. Next slide, please. So consumers want to support health and view food as that protector and cure. Uh, in a survey we've conducted in 2019, over 20,000 people around the world, 50% uh, of them are following a special diet. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're emphasizing food and, and looking at food critically. So consumers are seeking benefits from those special diets and new ingredients. They're driven by uh, you know, new food beliefs. Um, and it's not just food, you know, people are looking at, at the essential oil market that's growing into a multi-billion dollar industry globally. People look at the vitamins and supplement market, a multi-billion dollar market. Beans is now part of that mix, okay? Um, and it's a prominent part. Um, so novelty and health benefits of beans allow action, uh, manufacturers to begin to experiment and to innovate because consumers are opening up and they're saying, hey, I'll try your product if it's good for me. Go ahead, come up with something new for me. And they're experimenting. Next slide. Uh, these are based on a couple of surveys that uh, Euromonitor did quite uh, substantial, uh, over 40,000 people surveyed. Um, and out of that on the left-hand side, you see I have an animal product eating restriction. Uh, nearly 46% uh, of, of those surveyed across the markets that we examined indicated that that was true. Um, I follow a vegan diet. Um, if you notice, um, it, pretty substantial numbers. Um, uh, when you think about veganism, 
which is clearly on the rise. This was a 2019 survey. In 2020, the, the, the percentage in the US is well above 3%. So um, these numbers are growing um, and uh, you know people are moving toward plant-based diets and it isn't just a trend, it's a lifestyle change. That's really important. Next slide. So when you think about the dynamics of this, this isn't just one thing that's driving the market in the transition. This is the synergy of everything coming together to make this global change happen. One of the things we need to pay particular attention to is that the population shift, you know, approximately 7.85 billion people are in the world right now. We're expected to, at a conservative level, reach 9.7 billion by 2050. Um, what this roughly means when you consider deaths uh, that will also take place is that 2.75 billion people need to be born into this world. Um, so between now and 2050, 2.75 billion people. What that means then is 28% of the mouths that are going to be in this world are not here yet, okay? We are changing the world and the world's perception of beings. When, when these new mouths come into this world, they're gonna come into a world where, where there are biofortified beings, where there are, uh, where bean flour is in processed products, where there are uh, bean burgers, where there are uh, bean-based snack foods, all sorts of things will be their normal. That won't be uh, some innovative thing to try. It'll just be the way that it is. Um, so next slide, please. So this is what I want to highlight is that that consumers are seeking really greater safety, security, and just a better way forward. So we have changing diets to address general health, perspectives on ethical consumerism, what I eat matters, what I eat affects the planet, let me do something better. There are chronic conditions. I want to treat my obesity. I want to treat high cholesterol. I need to be careful that my heart, uh, you know, my blood pressure uh, is in control and disease outbreaks. How do we control this, uh, you know, in a disease outbreak? Um, you know, what can I do to protect myself during an outbreak? Uh, COVID-19 is a perfect example. You know, spikes in demand for vitamin D, spikes in demand for, um, you know, uh, shelf-stable products, things that uh, made consumers look and consider health in the human condition. Uh, climate change awareness, uh, increasing concern for the environment, sustainable, sustainable food production, better solutions. If a global response is needed to save the planet, consumers are beginning to ask what role could or should I play? Um, food contamination, production challenges, supply disruptions. When you think about African swine flu, overfishing, GMO concerns, impacts from droughts, fires, floods, there is constant pressure on the system to, uh, you know, to change, okay? And the changes that are good can, can include beans because beans is naturally healthy. It's better for the environment, can be grown in a lot of places. It's already a part of everybody's diet in some way, shape, or form or for many. And it's appealing to the ongoing lifestyle changes. The last thing is evidence of all of this, and then we'll conclude. Um, I just want you to think about how this is changing the world. Uh, plant and Bean has just introduced a new plant-based production facility in, in the UK. It's going to be the largest plant-based meat, quote unquote, pr production facility. It's gonna produce 55,000 tons per year. They're also gonna open up in North America and in China very, very soon over the next couple of years. In Israel, redefined meat has developed a manufacturing process to make plant-based proteins more closely resemble choice cuts of beef. So they're going to do a large 3D uh, printing um, of meat products, and they're gonna be doing that by the end of the year. Impossible foods, they're lowering the cost on, on uh, you know, plant-based uh, alternatives. They're cutting price by 20%. Nestle's Harvest Gourmet plant-based foods, they're marketed as nutritious and environmentally friendly. They just are, they're getting ready to launch in Thailand next month. They've already launched in China, Singapore, and Malaysia. And then of course, McDonald's, I, it looks like we have testing in here twice. McDonald's is testing McPlant this month in Denmark and Sweden. 
Um, this is their, uh, you know, plant-based food alternative. Um, they already had previously launched uh, uh, their uh, McVegan sandwiches uh, in these markets. But you're seeing a global commitment to plant-based products. This is, a, this is not just a trend. This is a permanent change that's going on in the world. What's important right now is for everybody to get, grab that space, you know, ride that change, promote it. It's going to lower the cost of beans. It's going to penetrate beans into uh, the diets of the world. And it's going to offer those tremendous benefits to the world going forward. Uh, all the things that you've heard the previous speakers mention, uh, as well as some of those covered in, in my presentation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have the time. Sorry for the time overrun, uh, but I appreciate everyone staying with us. That's quite all right, Matt. It was fascinating and we really appreciate you. Um, we know we're a little bit over time. Uh, we appreciate everyone sticking with us. Um, throughout the presentation, we've had uh, many, many people joining us and uh, we will, I'll, we did add some questions. I'll quickly just say that we've heard today from farmers in Eswatini, Rwanda, Guatemala, Michigan, Iowa, all asking how they can get these beans. Um, the good news is they're, they're there for you in many cases. And we'll be happy to connect you with the folks that, that can get you those products. Um, we did hear from somebody that lives in Italy that says it might be a little bit of a challenge to do uh, bean pizza in Italy. But I think, uh, you know, Sharon's showing some really great stuff when it comes to the ability to create a really delicious tasting product with, with high inclusion rates of beans. Um, I will uh, throw one question over to uh, Arun Baral. Um, Arun, if you could come back on. And this one is about um, just asking about how this partnership uh, will help ensure that more people around the world have access to biofortified beans. Um, Arun, I'm not sure if you're there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, good question. You know, so <clears throat> multiple ways. You know, uh, I mean, these crops have been released in um, uh, Africa, Latin America, and um, you know, we are also um, engaging in these awareness campaigns uh, and building partnerships and alliances also to make people aware, because really, you know, it has to be demand driven. And our partnership with the uh, U.S. Dry Bean Council is a step in the direction, um, number one, raise awareness, and then also uh, work with the council uh, to bring, uh, you know, the beans here in the United States for testing, adaptation, you know, those kinds of things. And then hopefully, you know, get it in the hands of the U.S. farmers so that even here, um, you know, these crops can be grown and, you know, either consumed locally or, you know, as Torek talked about, you know, can they be part of the, you know, food food aid, food assistance, and, uh, you know, provide um, an access, uh, you know, through food also, not just, you know, from a seed perspective, but also from food perspective, provide access to, um, to you know, millions of millions of people who, who, who need it and who want it. So there, there are two sides of it. There's the commercial side, you know, there's a huge market. We heard Sharon talk about it. Uh, we heard um, Matt talk about the trends, and and those are, you know, I mean, they're hard to ignore. You know, these these will become mega trends, as you know, in very shortly if they have not already begun. Uh, uh, so there's a commercial side, and then you know, from our side, we also want to make sure that we address hidden hunger, and we don't forget, um, you know, the two or the three billion people that need our help. So, so you know, if the U.S. farmers um, can adopt and grow these beans, um, and you know, we put them in the food aid, um, it'll be a it'll be a win-win. So again, you know, in Africa, Latin America, these beans are released in many many countries. Um, you know, reach out to uh, um, our representative, either I would say Ben yourself or Jenny Walton. We can guide people, you know, where these, uh, you know, how to get a hold of these seeds, um, and then, you know, in, in countries where they are not yet available, um, you know, for example, maybe the United States, um, you know, other than the white beans that Sharon talked about, are already here, but you know, the other, um, 
uh, the pinto and uh, in the, the uh, common beans, we can work on getting the beans here in the United States, get them tested and get them in the hands of the farmers. Thanks, Varun. That's what it's all about is getting the seeds in the hands of the farmers. Yep. And as uh, Katrian said, working along the value chain to get those beans into food processing, into food aid, um, and everywhere, because uh, beans are a core staple of the food system, and they're a really amazing, nutritious one. So some of the recent questions, yes, we're in Zambia. Um, yes, we're in these different places. Please go ahead and give us an email. We'll be happy to connect you with the various uh, seed growers that we happen to know in these places. Um, we'll be happy to get you access to those seeds. And we continue to look forward to, to seeing how we can work with all of you here today, uh, whether it was the representatives from USDA who shared a brown their work in Guatemala with high iron beans, um, or our private sector partners as well. Um, beans are for everyone. I know they're for me. And I think uh, we've all learned today about the amazing role that they can play uh, in the global food system. So I'm gonna go fix myself a plate of beans for lunch. I hope you will as well. Uh, we're so grateful for all of you for joining us here today. Again, you can find some handouts with some additional information by clicking in the toolbox uh, in your uh, WebEx GoToWebinar uh, tool, and you'll be able to click on handouts and download some things. Uh, please feel free to email us, uh, harvestplus at cgiar.org. We can connect your, your questions to the U.S. Dry Bean Council. We can connect your questions to any of the panelists here today. Um, and we apologize for running over time. Uh, we want to respect your time. So we are going to close out, but we'll be happy to follow up with everyone uh, specifically around some of the questions you asked. So thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.